At this time, I'd like to call. I'm just going. You good? Yeah. All right. At this time, I'd like to call the regular meeting of the Board of Education of October 18 to order at 6:35. I won't. All second. <clears throat> Andrew, can you call the roll? Who is the Alamio? Yes. Here. Here. <laughs> Andrea Delzati here. Allison Downs here. Tina Awanio here. Stephanie. Mina Sada here. Jennifer Ziegler here. Also in attendance is Dr. Brzezewski, Dr. Leva, Ms. Magnello, Mr. Humbles, Mr. Dini, Mr. Moranto, Dr. Kurtzmas, Ms. Howlett. Sorry, I didn't even see who's all here. Dr. Stavru, Ms. Maglioni. Yep. Yes. Uh, Ms. Sendelbach, Ms. Groki, and Mr. Amsler. Nope. Okay. <laughs> okay, we have a quorum. Please stand for the pledge. To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. First item on the agenda is the consent agenda. I would like to entertain a motion that the Board of Education establish the consent agenda as presented. I'll move. A second. Are there any questions, comments, or concerns? Okay. Andrea, call the roll. Alamio? Yes. Delzati? Yes. Downs? Yes. Iwanio? Yes. Sada? Yes. Ziegler? Yes. Okay. Motion passes. Moving on, I'd like to entertain a motion that the Board of Education approve the consent agenda. I'll move. I'll second. Any questions, comments, or concerns? Andrea, call the roll. Alamio? Yes. Delzati? Yes. Downs? Yes. Iwanio? Yes. Sada? Yes. Ziegler? Yes. <laughs> okay. There was no action, I there was no items removed from the consent agenda, so we'll skip that. Um, public participation. Do you guys have any anybody fill out any sheets for public participation? No. Um, in the board packet was the enrollment report. Were there any questions on the enrollment reports? Okay. The next item on the agenda is board business. The first topic is the Triple I conference. And that's November 19th, 17th through the 19th. So the only suggestion I have, and it's in your update, is to try to carpool. As you know, parking is a premium. Um, Kinga is preparing your packet and um, all the information for your sessions. You're not, I keep asking you this, you're not going to a pre-conference, right? Correct. Okay. So we're good. Questions? I'll be coming down to see you guys present. Right in center. I'm sure. <laughs> And then the next item is the IASB board leader recognition. So Allison maintained her master board member status. We're very proud of Allison. <laughs> Allison sets a fine example for the rest of the board, especially our new members. So thank you, Allison, for your leadership. You're welcome. Thank you. Congratulations. Congratulations. Um, being a master board member is especially um, something to be proud of because it's going above and beyond your duties as a board member and it's taking time out of your, beyond what you do here for Schiller Park and doing things for, for IASBO, the Illinois Association of School Boards. And recently, Allison has joined the committee then. Um, and so we're honored that you take on that role and you have such a prominent face outside of here at the table and in our thank school you. building. So thank you. We can't wait to see the impact you're going to have on that committee. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Organization first. <laughs> um, next up is old information. There's no, there is no old information, old business. So we'll move on. New business information. Um, we have the NWEA feature presentation. So we have Nola Bradal here with us from Wyoming, is it? 
Yes. Well, <laughs> for, all the way from Wyoming, uh, representing NWEA, she is the VP of Partner Accounts. And she's going to talk to you a little bit about the uh, partnership that we had with Chase and the research project he did. Um, we also have, who's here, we have Allison Lane. Okay. And um, I always do this to you. Christina. I do this to you every time, Vandekar, and I love you so much. Christina Vandekar, both teachers from Lincoln School who participated in the project. The, do we have, is that it? Kramagi, okay. She couldn't be here tonight. And Okay, that's fine. So these are the two teachers from Lincoln that are with us, and we'll let you go ahead with your presentation. Great. Well, thank you so much for inviting us. I'm absolutely thrilled to be here. Um, I'm sorry, I'm going to turn my back to you. So I no, I, I hope everyone does turn. Please turn so you can see. I hope you're not, it's sort of like you're at the front of the movie theater, I feel. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to slide this way, that's totally fine. Um, but I really appreciate you allowing me time to share with you the truly transformative work that we have seen from Schiller Park teachers. Um, and the leaders, I really want to emphasize this, the leaders who support them and foster the environment through which the teachers can do the things that they do so well. So thank you. Um, but by un better understanding the teaching strategies of high growth schools like Schiller Park, we're able to share that information with others. Um, at NWEA, our mission is to ensure that we help all students grow. All students learn, and um, that is our central core mission. So just a note, and you'll, you probably figured it out already, but all the photos you're going to see today are from Schiller Park. Um, and it also with um, our researcher, Chase Nordgren, um, with, from his time with all of you in the classroom. So this is exciting. Now let me see if I can move the slides. Yes. So in 2018, and I realize this is pre-pandemic, um, but NWA researcher Andrew Andy Hegedus, and I'm not going to read all the slides to you, um, so I'll, I, I don't want to do that to you. That would be rather boring. But anyway, <laughs> Andy, um, he began an exploration with one of our... Um, one of these large systems, the longitudinal data on the achievement and growth of 700,000 students in 24,500 public school districts present in our map growth assessment. So his study, what he did, he found that schools showing high levels of growth were not necessarily those that showed high levels of achievement. And it's really important to differentiate between growth and achievement, okay? Um, but that also high growth schools could exist in communities that have a variety of income levels and demographics. He and our next question, of course, then was a much smaller one. Um, what can be learned from those high growth schools about teaching and learning? So a lot has happened since um, 2018, including, of course, the generational pandemic that we've experienced. And it's, but the pandemic has really stretched schools to the brink. Um, it stretched everyone to the brink, right? And further expanded gaps between students that are at the same grade levels. You all know that. <laughs> um, so research from several organizations, including NWEA, found that students affected by the pandemic Pandemic showed an even wider variety of achievement le levels um, than ever before. So, what about these high growth schools distinguishes them from their peers? And to help answer that question, in 2020, our NWA researchers took a deep dive into map growth data, and they identified 789 schools across the country that produced high growth year over year for students achieving, um, for students across all achievement levels. So whether a child is below, at, or above, grade level, they're all, here at Schiller Park we saw it, they were all achieving mm -hmm. at all achievement levels. Y'all did that for six years. <laughs> I mean, it's impressive. So, um, 
as you can expect, some of the schools, some of these 789 schools, they sit in high income communities that serve homogenous students. Um, but others serve a diverse variety of students and work with the same kinds of limited resources that most schools in the U.S. work with. Um, so for this zoom into high growth for all schools, our study focuses on two of these schools and that's the elementary and middle schools here at Schiller Park. So Schiller Park schools look a lot like many other schools across the country. Um, there are 55% of the students in your district are non-white. 62% of your students receive free or reduced lunch. Um, 25 of your students are identified as English language learners. And your per pupil spending in 2021 was about $2,000 below the state average. Mm. Yet, yeah, look at what you're doing. <laughs> so, um, you beat the odds and you're producing higher than typical student growth. And as you can see in that last column, six years in a row. Um, so again, it's the middle and ele um, elementary school te uh, teachers here that are featured. Um, they produced higher than typical student growth across every decile of student achievement. So kids who are in the 10th percentile grew above average, ten kids in the 20th percentile, 30th, 40th, 90th, etc. They all grew um, above average, above typical student growth. And this, these four, I guess two of which, Christina and Allison, are here. Round of applause. Um, this is who, these four teachers though, is who Chase Nordgren came in and observed um, just so to try and understand and find the balance between all the conflicting priorities you have when you're teaching and during this challenging time. So this is Chase Nordgrim in the background there, taking his notes, and he really saw firsthand, and these were his words, impactful, joyful, effective instruction. And the importance of the impact that has on our learners, our educators, and the entire school community. So we appreciate immensely the level of access that has been provided to us. Um, so we appreciate all of you for granting us that access um, and allowing us to come in and do our research. And as you can see, 75 hours of observed instruction, recording everyone, I'm sure asking a bazillion questions. Um, thank you so much for allowing us to do what we do best and where our hearts lie. So I want to segue into like if you walk into the average classroom now, um, we all know and it's always been true that all kids are not on grade level, right? You've always got some high achievers, you've got kids that are right where they're supposed to be, you've got kids below, you've got all these different spaces where kids are learning. But post-pandemic, academic diversity is higher than it has ever been. Um, superintendents, in a recent poll that NWEA and um, some other organizations have done, and we've triangulated our data, so it's not just us saying this, it's other organizations too. Um, but recent information is telling us that half our kids are below grade level across the country. Um, and as many as 10% of our kids are two or more grades below grade level. Hence why it's so important to make higher than average growth. If most kids make one year's worth of growth, that's excellent, but are they catching up to where they really need to be? And we're talking about vast numbers of students in this country. So the challenge just obviously grew with the pandemic. Um, and so we wanted to address some ideas. How do we address this? So 
With growing academic diversity in a classroom, the question remains what kind of instruction best helps student grow? And this is a really big debate, actually. Um, there's many approaches to instruction. As, there's as many approaches as there are teachers, quite frankly. And the debate goes around what makes for the most effective teaching. Is it providing all students with grade level access and information or and content or is it by pulling kids out and addressing them where they are <clears throat> which could be above at or below right um, so under and there's just been so much unfinished learning due to the pandemic and which existed before as well I mean this is not a new conversation you all know that more than I do um, but but the volume of the debate has truly intensified because of the pandemic so both grade level instruction and differentiation are simply non-negotiable we, we recognize that and they're, these are features of the modern classroom. So teachers can and must balance both of these priorities to achieve high growth for all students. And you know that I'm just sort of setting the stage to say that this is what you all did. So, um, so within these themes that you can see here on the left, Three themes emerged from um, our research. And from that, we have found 10 transformative instructional strategies that we call the transformative 10. And these came from your sh four Schiller Park teachers as well as these other um, districts where we've done the same research. So what I'm going to do is introduce you to the transformative 10. I do want to call out um, that you all will have this PowerPoint. Um, on your desks are pamphlets of the transformative 10. So you can take this home with you and you can do with it as you please. You've got expert teachers here who are doing it already. Um, and then we are so appreciative because um, we're conducting a webinar in a couple of weeks, middle of November, um, with your leadership um, because we want to talk about not only the of 10, but creating how your district and leadership has been able to foster, create and foster an environment where teachers can do what they do. That's so important. So let's hop into the tools and techniques. Um, that teachers can use to balance differentiation with alongside of grade level instruction for every single student. So number one is supplemental learning time. I talked about this a little bit before. So this really is the focus of supplemental learning time is intervention. Um, and intervention is common everywhere you go. Um, the question is do you only pull out a few students whereby they're getting extra intervention to do things that maybe they, to catch them up. The downside of that, of course, is that then they're missing the grade level classroom instruction when we pull them out. So what we're talking about when it comes to supplemental learning time is providing time for small group supplemental instruction for all kids because then all kids can have an intervention whether you're below, at, or above, but that way all kids are still exposed to the whole group grade level instruction. Um, so this simply allows for reinforcing what's learned in the whole grade, practicing skills at the ability level of the student. And it doesn't vacate children from the grade level learning. And this does align with the learning science that um, has placed findings on um, weaving this practice in. The second thing is mixing whole group and small group instruction. Um, and I do have a video that talks about this one. And let's see if... Ah! Is it playing? Is it? Maybe. Get it. Ah! Thank you. It's it's a short video. Today, when you're meeting in your spring practice, 
The second strategy in optimizing time is about mixing up whole group, small group, and individual activities during the class period. What this does is allows the teacher to be, in essence, more than one place at once, providing different levels of instruction to different students so they can practice the skills and the knowledge that they in particular need. It allows me to do really quick observations and check in with them and see how they're doing. But then also having these small groups and these whole groups, even having different activities, it also builds their connection with each other. That's one thing that um, we've really been struggling on the last few years is having um, classmates working together and being able to control emotions and share items. So I think allowing them in all of these different aspects is they're in small group being able to communicate together. But then they're also using their verbal skills um, and allowing my ESL learners is a great way for them to learn from their classmates with their own vocabulary. I love when I hear, I was called the math talk. I love when I can hear the keywords while they're talking. So when I meet with my group, I can really focus on those kids and what they need. And then the other kids, they're still hitting those skills, but um, they're learning from each other. And that's what I always tell them. It's not only me, it's also your classmates that you can learn from. Now, let's see if I can. And I'll give you the link to the website. The website was up there, but we have created a high growth for all website. Um, oh, thank you. Whoops. Sorry. It's up. Uh, yep. There you go. Oh, perfect. Um, okay, so strategy number three um, is mixing groups up in real time. Um, we all know the dangers of tracking. Um, students who stay in one ability level group, and you know, as talking about before, they're missing core instruction. Um, teachers in the study made sure that student groups changed their groups every day. Um, it's important to mix homogeneous ability groupings with heter heter heterogeneous groups, ability grouping. Um, and the teachers are using formative assessment to verify where students should be and they're making shifts constantly. Number four is sharing students. Um, the easiest way to explain this really is with um, the subject of math. For example, if one teacher can support two or three groups, then two teachers can support four to six. Um, the groups are more specifically tailored, so to allow for more teacher attention. Um, whether this looks like full-on co-teaching or where some students are passing between classrooms during parts of the day is extremely dynamic. But the advantage is co-planning and co-executing on a differentiated teaching instruction. Um, differentiating tasks within a unit. Um, students don't have to do the same thing at the same pace in order to interact with the same standards or texts. Using formative as assessment, teachers find the pace and tasks appropriate to a student's level of challenge so they can mix student experiences and especially during the reflection afterward. So we're really creating a lot more dynamic conversation. So providing time to work on foundational skills. Our research, not just our research, but universally, research does say that students who are behind grade level, they'll often lack that prior grade level skills to effectively be able to participate. Um, so things like online activities, warm up exercises, um, just using a skill of the week um, are really good intervention um, practices. So all of this would allow for reviewing and recontextualizing the important skills of each specific standard. 
And then we are also interested, especially in being able to teach multiple standards. So there's no rule that says kids have to learn standards one, isolated and one at a time from beginning to end. Um, the teachers, in our, as what we were learning, that um, they were using structure of the school day to offer instruction across multiple standards. Um, there's, there's definitely some benefits to this. It means that standards aren't going to get skipped. Um, it hits the learning sciences goal of spacing practice throughout the year. And it's actually a nice change of pace. Um, and it allows, additionally, for project-based learning. Number eight, um, self-directed learning. This is really a lot about getting kids to take responsibility for their own learning. Um, so any activity which allows a student to select or decide what they're going to work on, what speed they're going to work on it at, it just gives them that responsibility to finish the work. And it doesn't have to be all the time. It can be occasional, um, or it could be the basis for a full curriculum. It's however you want to work this in at your district. Um, but it really does allow for the important thing here is ownership of one's education. So this one is all about getting kids to talk to one another, um, especially important post-pandemic, right? Um, kids being able to verbalize what they've learned, um, and especially at higher order level of thinking, um, some skills only appear when kids are talking. They're, are not tests that you can take that display this higher level of thinking. Um, so you the, and it was in one of the videos. You have to be able to hear what the kids are saying, right? You have to hear that they're using the language. So it's an opportunity for the kids to practice, um, and it's an opportunity for the teachers to gather what they're hearing the students say. Um, and what this looks like is things like having debates in class, um, kids giving out reports on activities and again students just talking to one another. So and the, the final one that we have here is academic vocabulary. You actually heard it in the video where the teacher was talking about you know you're going to work on fractions and here's and he, you're going to start with your denominator right um, so this kind of has to this takes planning because you have to think about the prerequisite skills for that lesson um, but knowing what the words mean what's a numerator what's a denominator um, it allows just allowing kids to interact with that um, specific language and for those of you are who are familiar with Marzano um, you know, it says no, vocabulary is background knowledge. Um, and knowing the words that make the knowledge available so they can apply the learning. So your teachers were dedicating specific time and resources towards practicing these words and definitions is what we observe them doing. So... In summary, I'm really excited again to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Appreciate it greatly. Um, and I want you all to know that I am, not me, NWA as a whole, is sharing the work of Schiller Park, like literally with a megaphone. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, and the whole purpose is because you've got these phenomenal teachers. You've obviously got an environment where they're allowed to do what they're doing. But we want other teachers to learn from the best practices that you have shared with us. And we thank you for that. Um, so in addition, in addition to the white paper that you have on your tables, um, like I mentioned, we've made a website. Uh, if you Google NWA High Growth for All, um, we've got a video documentary. Um, and there is a video for every single one of the 10 strategies that I very super quickly summarized for you. Um, and as well, we've then we've got a guide as that goes much more in depth um, to these different strategies that can be leveraged. 
So with that, um, just sort of announcing the webinar I had mentioned earlier, and this is, you know, Good teaching happens everywhere, but it's not supported district-wide everywhere. We know we have star teachers all over everywhere, and we're very thankful, but we're also f thankful for the environments that, uh, that foster them being able to do what they do. So this is the reason we are hosting the webinar, so we can spread the news and share it with um, the whole country. And again, thank you very much um, for your time and allowing me to share with you what we've done, what you've done. You know what you've done. So, <laughs> all right, that is it. Thank you, Nola, for being here. Absolutely, my pleasure. Thank you, Christina. I didn't want to call you Vandekar, so I was just we middle school teachers call each other by the last name. Allison and Christina, thank you so much. I appreciate all you do for our students. They're very blessed to have you. I say it all the time. I mean, when I'm stressed, I can go sit in Allison's room and I just calm down. <laughs> Same thing with Christina. They're just amazing with the kids, and we're just really, really blessed to have such outstanding teachers. And that you choose to stay with us is a really big deal, and we just appreciate you very much. So thank you. We're proud of you. Very proud of you. I mean, that is just amazing just to see, you know, taking those 10 things and throwing it in their classroom with your 30 different students, with their 30 different attitudes and personalities. It's not an easy feat. Um, and you guys have done this consistently over time, and it's amazing. Um, the three words you used were impactful, effective, and joyful. I like the joyful because my kids want to wake up and come to school. <laughs> so, um, you know, but if you summarize it super easy, it's everything Kim has always said, right? It's student-centered learning. It's focusing on the student, directing learning to the student, giving students the authority to feel like this is their own classroom, that they own it. And that's just amazing work. And we are so proud and so honored. So thank you. Thank you. I'm glad that we're curious about the world. Yes. <laughs> you always know we had a little secret here in Jordan. Yes. So what's the funny thing about it is they called us and you know they're like, do you want to be a part of a research study? And of course, you know me, I don't like we don't like a lot of attention. We just keep our head down, do our work, and we're not looking for that, right? But the best part about this NWEA project was, and I always say this, is you found us. We didn't come looking for you. And that that's really important to me because we're not looking for accolades. We're just here doing good work for kids. And to get recognized for that without asking for it really means a lot to us, right? Because the good work they're doing is finally, it, they didn't look for that. I didn't look for that. My administrator, my principals didn't look for that. You found us. And that means so much. And I say that all the time because they're the unsung heroes, right, doing this great work. And, you know, we try to honor them and give them little trinkets and tell them how much they mean to us, and I hope they know that. But to get national recognition, that's something so much different and so much broader, and we, we just couldn't be more proud. So thank you, and thanks to the board for supporting us and allowing these things to happen. Without you, I always say that, it starts here at this table, and it trickles into the into the learning community. So your decisions matter. And because of you, you know, Noah's here with us today and your learning community is being recognized at a very high level and you should be proud of that because I know I am. So that's it. I always feel like moving on is like closing that and moving to the <laughs> <laughs> but Yeah, that's super exciting. So, but we all want to go home too. So, um, uh, the next item up for new business is the November 2023 Board of Education meeting time. So, without going into a lot of detail, we do have something planned that evening, and I'm hoping that the board is willing to start that meeting at 5:30. It was in your board update as to why that would be. Is that okay with everyone, or yeah. does that work? Yeah. So, yeah. we'll yeah, just okay. move forward. Okay. Awesome. Thanks. Okay, so thank you again. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, new business action. 
I'd like to entertain a motion that the Board of Education approve the resolution 2401 of the Board of Education directing the school treasurer to permanently transfer monies in the amount of $350,000 for the o &M fund to the Capital Projects Fund. I'll move. John. Are there any questions, comments, or concerns? Andrea, call the roll. Alamio? Yes. Delzati, yes. Downs? Yes. Iwanio? Yes. Sada? Yes. Ziegler? Yes. Okay. Motion passes. I'd like to entertain a motion that the Board of Education approve resolution 2402 of the Board of Education directing the school treasurer to permanently transfer monies in the amount of 350000 from the Education Fund to the Capital Projects Fund. Move. A second. Any questions, comments, or concerns? Andrea, call the roll, please. Alamio? Yes. Delzati, yes. Downs? Yes. Iwanio? Yes. Sada? Yes. Ziegler? Yes. Okay. Motion passes. The next item is executive session, but we took care of all the items during our special meeting, so we'll skip that. Um, so first motion on closed session items is, I would like to entertain a motion that the Board of Education maintain the closed session meetings of the minutes of March 2021 to August 21, closed to the public as discussed. I'll move. I'll second. Any questions, comments, or concerns? Andrea, call the roll, please. Alamio? Yes. Delzati, yes. Downs? Yes. Iwanio? Yes. Sada? Yes. Ziegler? Yes. Motion passes. <clears throat> I'd like to entertain a motion that the Board of Education maintain the closed session minutes meetings of March 2022 to August 2022, closed to the public as discussed. I'll move. I'll second. Any questions, comments, or concerns? Call Alamio? Yes. Delzati, yes. Downs? Yes. Iwanio? Yes. Sada? Yes. And Ziegler? Yes. Okay. I'd like to entertain a motion that the Board of Education maintain the closed session meeting minutes of March 2023 to August 2023, closed to the public as discussed. I'll move. I'll second. Any questions, comments, or concerns? Okay. Andrea, call the roll. Alamio? Yes. Delzati, yes. Downs? Yes. Iwanio? Yes. Sada? Yes. Ziegler? Yes. Next item. I'd like to entertain a motion that the Board of Education approve the administrative contract as discussed. Alamio? A second. Any questions, comments, or concerns? Andrea, call the roll. Alamio? Yes. Delzati, yes. Downs? Yes. Iwanio? Yes. Sada? Yes. And Ziegler? Yes. Motion passes. Um, Stav, I'd just like to say to you on behalf of the board um, that we are very excited for you in your new role. Um, and we are excited that you're going to be sharing your love with a direct impact on all the students of the district. The next item is I would like to entertain a motion that the Board of Education approve the personnel report from the month of October as presented. I'll move. Second. Andrea, can you call the roll, please? Alamio? Yes. Delzati, yes. Downs? Yes. Iwanio? Yes. Sada? Yes. Ziegler? Yes. Is there any public participation? Seeing none, I'd like to entertain a motion that the Board of Education adjourn the regular board meeting of October 18th at 7.14 p.m. I'll second. Alamio? Yes. Delzati, yes. Downs? Yes. Iwanio? Yes. Sada? Yes. Ziegler? Yes. All right, motion passes. We need to turn.